I, I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to this uh, joint webinar series on digital cooperation during the COVID-19 uh, um, crisis and beyond. And I'd particularly like um, to, to, to welcome our, our principal uh, speaker, uh, and we're very lucky that we can start this yeah. series with him, Vince uh, who, of course, is um, an iconic uh, figure um, in the, the digital world. And I think uh, few have as much accumulated wisdom and insight. So I think it's very fitting that we should start off with him. I'm also honored to co-chair this with my, my friend and colleague, um, uh, Assistant Secretary General Doran Bogdan uh, from ITU. And this is uh, another example of a, uh, of a growing number of examples of ITU UN Secretariat uh, cooperation. We're also, um, and, and this shows the broader uh, UN family involvement, uh, lucky to have Chris Fabian um, of UNICEF as one of our facilitators and also Alex Wong um, of ITU. So, let me say two words about the substance before handing over to, to Doreen. I think um, the pandemic, um, which came um, uh, in a surprising way, um, has vindicated in a manner that none of us would have anticipated um, the, 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 the validity and the life-saving utility of digital technologies. In this era, in ways that uh, has never been possible before in, in, in times of crisis. Um, we've been able to keep working, keep studying, keep connected to family and friends, keep in good health, keep entertained, and keep having meetings like this one, um, thanks to the um, emergence and dominance of digital uh, technology. Digital technology has also played a major role in, um, in enhancing the response, in bringing us real-time public health information in ways that were not previously possible, in crowdsourcing uh, solutions and approaches, in tracking people movements and allowing authorities to fine tune and enhance uh, their response to this uh, public um, health uh, crisis. But these massive um, uh, benefits that digital technology um, has brought us also have uh, a shadow side. And I think it's that shadow side that these, seminar these um, webinars are aimed at trying to find formulas to better address. And I want to highlight three. First of all, of course, these massive benefits that we have uh, depend on being connected. And as we know, um, many people, for many different reasons, in many parts of the world, are not connected. And I think the enhanced digitalization uh, of our lives for those who are connected is going to leave behind greater and deeper inequalities uh, with regard to those who are not um, connected. So I think that's one major issue, and that, in fact, is the subject of today's debate. Um, what measures can we take uh, quickly to address better the connectivity um, issue? The second issue relates to content. And of course, in, in, there have been different approaches in different countries of the world, with a sort of very laissez-faire approach in some countries and a very intrusive approach in others. Um, the the, the uh, approaches to content moderation have reflected national um, differences in terms of media control but I think those issues have come to the to the fore um, we've seen as I've said how positive content um, on uh, spread through digital means in terms of preventive measures in terms of public health information have been tremendously helpful and have saved lives but we've also seen how disinformation um, has endangered uh, people, disinformation uh, spread by social media. We've also seen how hate speech and stigmatization has spread on, on social media. And I think we've also seen how both platforms and governments, who in the past have been really very reticent um, in some countries to exercise any form of moderation, 
in face of this public health crisis have actually stepped up efforts to try and boost positive content and contain uh, dangerous um, content. Um, a third aspect um, that I want to highlight among the shadow sites is, of course, the security issue. And there are two aspects to this I want to highlight. One is the security of infrastructure. Uh, and we've seen attacks on WHO websites. We've heard of attacks on, on, on hospitals. We've heard of disruptions to um, social uh, media platforms and platforms for, for group chats uh, like this. But the other aspect of security is data protection. And we've seen an unprecedented use by public authorities of use of private and telephone data in order to, um, for, 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 for legitimate public health purposes. Um, but that it's given rise to a series of questions of what is the legitimate use of such data? How can data be anonymized? To what extent can you um, track data uh, for punitive purposes? And to what extent can the, will these extraordinary measures that have been adopted now in ways that I think most people would regard on the whole as legitimate, but how do you make sure they're stood down after the crisis um, is over? So I think those are some of the three um, areas I wanted to highlight um, and that um, we will consider in this webinar series. Of course, many of these issues, and connectivity is the obvious one, are not things that have a quick solution. Uh, and many of these issues we will be addressing in the Secretary General's roadmap in follow-up to the high-level panel where we were very lucky to have Vint participate. Um, and we will be considering those issues and the longer term ways of addressing them in the Secretary General's roadmap um, in follow up to the panel that will come out in early May. I think where these webinars will have an added value is to see and consider what can be done in the short term. And there are things, even for connectivity, that can be done in the short term. I mean, in New York, um, there is obviously a uh, very little problem. One would be wrong to suggest, as a re and I can tell you this as a resident here, to say that there's no, pro no problem with connectivity because even in parts of Brooklyn, it's very hard to get a, a, a 4G signal. But, um, um, th but, that, but I heard the other day that in New York, there are 300,000 uh, people who don't have devices um, that allow them to connect to the, to the internet. Um, so, you know, there are issues even in very uh, developed places where there are immediate problems with connectivity that can, in fact, be resolved in a relatively straightforward way. So I hope these webinars will help us find ways uh, to address um, some of the short-term measures uh, to address uh, the, the, the difficulties um, that, have, that have been highlighted through this um, pandemic. Um, so with that, I'd, um, I'd like to, to hand over to, to, to um, Doreen. I must say we have some wonderful high-level speakers from all regions of the world that will come in later um, after Vint. But I'd like to thank you all for joining. And I hope very much by banging our heads together, I mean, um, digitally, uh, we can come up with some ideas uh, about um, solutions to address some of the gaps and others, I'm sure, that exist uh, that will I've mentioned and that others will mention. So thank you all, um, and especially to ITU, uh, for making this possible. Thank you so much, uh, Fabrizio. Uh, digital headbanging. <laughs> I like that. Um, so good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first of, of four webinars on digital cooperation. Uh, during COVID and beyond. Um, one of the things the unprecedented events of the past few weeks uh, has dramatically illustrated um, is the vital, essential importance, as Fabrizio um, demonstrated, uh, the importance of connectivity. Digital has really become the, the hidden hero, as some have called it. Uh, and of course, we are the privileged, we are the connected. Uh, we are using uh, technology to help ensure that our lives continue as, as normally as they possibly can uh, and that our work uh, can continue even if we're not physically present 
uh, technology is helping our kids to continue their studies, and most vitally of all, it's helping the world's health workers deal with the global challenge unlike anything that we've ever seen in our lifetimes. And of course, helping medical research researchers collaborate across borders, around the clock, in an urgent search for a vaccine. Today is the, the, the first session of this uh, four series of, of webinars, and we're going to be focusing on the need for connectivity, a situational assessment. Uh, connectivity, as I said, has never been so important, so crucial. Our figures show us that 3.6 billion people remain totally cut off from the internet. And I suspect that that shocking figure might actually prove to be a conservative one. Uh, right now, even in my home country of the United States, the birthplace of the net and one of the most connected countries on the planet, uh, the FCC is embarking on a remapping exercise to extend broadband to over 20 million uh, US house households that remain unconnected. And I think what, what's, what's more is last year's State of Broadband report from the UN uh, Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development highlighted that so many people that we consider connected uh, actually lack the speed, the devices, and the affordability of service that would make this connectivity meaningful in their lives. And of course, added to this is the additional COVID-19 related strain on ICT networks uh, that's really causing traffic levels to surge and also changing usage patterns. And that really is putting to the test the very connectivity that we would have normally considered to be sufficient. And of course, for all of us participating in this meeting, we, we really would have difficulty imagining uh, what our lives would be like without the internet. And what we need to remember is that right now, every second person on the planet has to live without this vital lifeline. They live without the internet. Uh, we in the international community, we share a conviction that all people must enjoy access to the same uh, equal opportunities. Um, and of course, in the 21st century, leaving no one behind means uh, that everyone should have meaningful access to digital technologies. Uh, Fabrizio mentioned the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation. Uh, and I think we need to stress that word cooperation because cooperation is key. ITU together with our sister agencies has been co-championing some of the recommendations of the high level panel, uh, the one on global connectivity, uh, and also the recommendation on digital help desks. And we've been engaging in uh, multi-stakeholder discussions all focused on bridging the digital divide. Uh, and I think our webinar today is just one example uh, of what we can do together. So COVID-19 is a wake-up call, as we know, a wake-up call for all of us. Uh, and it's a wake-up call about the vital importance of getting and keeping the world connected. And I'm using the power of technology to improve our preparedness, our mitigation strategies, and our collective community response. It's really a wake-up call on why we need to dramatically accelerate efforts to bring the unconnected people and communities online. And as soon as we put this crisis behind us, which I hope is sooner rather than later, uh, we really need to get government and industry to urgently cooperate and partner on a global big dig uh, to get those without access connected as fast as possible. Uh, the next time around, because there may be a next time around, we cannot and we must not be caught unaware. Uh, and as the US President John F. Kennedy famously said, the time to mend the roof is when the sun is shining. Uh, and with that, Fabrizio, I think I'm handing to Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio. And thank you, Doreen. Alex Wong, uh, working uh, at the ICU, senior advisor. Many, uh, it's great to see so many friends uh, and colleagues on, on the call here. And uh, my job here, together with my, my counterpart, Chris Fabian, uh, from UNICEF is to make sure we get through the agenda and we finish on time as the first thing. Uh, I just wanted to recognize also some of our colleagues uh, that are on the chat. I already noticed uh, Vice Minister uh, Yamada, for example, our colleagues from the EU, Mexico, really great to have um, our member states uh, supporting us and we hope to hear from you during the call. 
As a reminder, if you want to make a comment and you're not familiar with Zoom, you have to go to the uh, chat box and put up your hand. And we have a moderator, uh, Abud, who's monitoring that, and, and we'll make sure we call on you in course. Uh, so what we're going to do in the next hour and 15 minutes, uh, already as mentioned by Fabrizio, we have Vint standing by to kind of kick us off. Then we have several of you lined up to share some initial thoughts and reactions. Uh, and then we have some reactions also from uh, the, the Secretary, Secretary General's high-level digital cooperation panel, uh, in particular the, the Group 1A on connectivity, uh, looked at some of the challenges that this crisis is creating and some of the solutions. And so uh, Chris and I were the co-leads uh, representing ITU and UNICEF on that particular work group. And we have many members of that work group on this call who I think will add in a few views uh, in terms of solutions uh, on what, what we can do going forward. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to my counterpart, uh, my colleague, Chris Fabian. Many of you who know Chris know he's gonna be the real hardcore timekeeper. That's not my job for this part of the call. So Chris, uh, over to you, please. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, uh, Fabrizio, Doreen, and thank you all for joining us. Um, my job is really to get out of the way and let some super interesting people talk about the work that they're doing. Um, and so I'll do this with sort of as small introductions as possible and as much trying to move us into conversation as I can. Uh, my other point, you'll, you'll hear me uh, before we go into the, into the speakers, the main speakers give a little bit of introduction to my unique and very annoying moderating style, but we'll do that after we hear some opening remarks from Vint, who I believe needs no introduction to this crowd. Um, although Vint, I did have a very strange dream about you last night where you asked me, other than TCP IP, what was my second favorite protocol? And that was a, that was a bizarre thing to wake up to. Um, so as you on the call know, uh, I'm sure Vint was responsible for developing many of the fundamentals of what we have uh, as the internet today and continues to be a leading thinker in the space of digital connectivity and digital gaps, uh, some of the issues that both Fabrizio and Doreen highlighted in their opening remarks. So Vint, we're really delighted to have you uh, give your opening remarks and hear from you um, sort of about the state of both what we have and what we should have and should aspire to in this difficult time, but also a time where there's perhaps some opportunity shining through uh, the clouds as well. Over to you, Vint. Thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to participate. I'm impressed that we have almost 280 people on this, uh, on this call. Uh, let me start out by thanking Fabrizio and Doreen and Alex uh, for their opening remarks. They've covered quite a bit of, uh, of the ground that I think we should be discussing today. Uh, let me start out by observing that the COVID-19 virus, uh, the pandemic, has actually uh, forced on us a kind of stock-taking exercise because we now recognize the utility of the internet and we ask ourselves, where is it and where is it not? and what can we do to make it uh, more available. I see this discussion today and the subsequent um, uh, interactions that we'll have as enabling exercises. That is to say, we are learning how to enable the outcomes uh, that we're looking for. Uh, we want to uh, expand access to the internet and to information and communication technologies. Uh, we want uh, this uh, access to be affordable, reliable, safe, accessible and useful, that is to say that it has content which is of use and it has language uh, capacity that allows people to get access to content in languages that they understand and speak. And of course, it has to be sustainable because if we take this uh, COVID-19 exercise uh, as a kind of forcing function and try to do something in a hurry, if we don't think this through properly, it won't be sustainable and we will have wasted uh, a substantial amount of effort. So figuring out how to do this uh, in alignment with the uh, sustainable uh, development goals, I think is a very important um, uh, element of all of this. Now, there are other enabling considerations that, uh, that we should keep in mind uh, as we try to enhance access uh, to, uh, to the internet. One of them has to do with a competitive regulatory framework so that we enable consumer choice. We want people to have more than one uh, choice about getting access to the network, either with regard to service or with regard to equipment. Second, a very, very important part of this whole discussion is education. Not simply education about how to get access and how to use it, but also uh, how to take advantage of this as a means of, uh, of making a living. Uh, or of inventing new products and services. So 
uh, at the bottom line, when you think about 50% of the world population not yet having had direct experience with the net, is to understand that they need to be literate with regard to uh, online environments. So digital literacy is very important. We need to be able to support entrepreneurship to take advantage of this, um, this infrastructure. And of course, there are by implication, risk capital and all the other apparatus that's needed to create and run companies uh, is vital. Uh, so what do we need to do immediately? Well, one thing we need desperately is high quality data. Where will we get that? Well, there are a couple of sources that immediately come to mind. There's a project that I started at Google with many others uh, outside of Google uh, called MLab for Measurement Lab. Uh, more recently, the Marconi Society, which I chair, uh, has initiated a, a program of digital inclusion, which includes getting access to better data. Where is the internet available? Where is it not available? At what speeds is it available? At what cost is it available? And I must tell you that uh, the data that is sometimes available is not always as reliable as we would like. In some cases, it's provided by the internet service providers who would like to look better than perhaps they really are. Uh, and I will even say that it's embarrassing, but I think it's true that some countries that report data want to look as good as possible. And so the data that they offer may not necessarily be as precise as we need it to be. So we need really good uh, quality sources of information. Then we have to ask ourselves what applications are feasible where Internet is available. Uh, can people use the World Wide Web and email? Can they use high-speed video conferencing as we are today? What, about, what other things uh, are possible? Uh, and finally, uh, collaborative applications. The one that we're, uh, the exercise we're in the middle of right this moment is a collaborative exercise uh, facilitated by uh, online technology and the internet. Uh, I think of all the kinds of collaboration I do with my colleagues at Google and others, um, where we have documents that we share and edit at the same time. And then we might even have a video conference going so we can argue over whatever the content of that document happens to be. So we have a, a really wonderful opportunity in the midst of crisis to use it as a, a, a rationale for doing really serious stock taking. So we can then plan how to get the internet in everyone's hands after this crisis is over so we can take advantage of it and to prepare for the next crisis that will assuredly come along. We just don't know what that black swan will be. So let me stop there. I've taken up more than I, than I should have. I'm very, very eager to hear from the rest of you uh, what your ideas are in order to make progress along these lines. Thank you. Thanks, Vin. You didn't get anywhere near either the yellow card or the red card, so... Um... Big congratulations on that. Um, we have a really exciting lineup of, of five uh, kind of situation analysis speakers who are going to give us an insight into their own markets, and then another set of six or so uh, people who will give us an even shorter, more precise input into some of the questions we're going to ask. Before we get into that, I uh, just wanted to flag three things. So first of all, I'm usually not invited to moderate twice because I bring these things with me. So we've given everybody, we've asked you to speak in for four minutes for the first group and for about uh, two minutes for the second group. We also uh, are monitoring the chat on the side. So John, he and others will pull comments from that and this will feed into the next set of webinars as well. So all of your comments are encouraged and it goes to Vince's third point on collaboration. Uh, this is really a unique way for us to all surface what we're thinking and what we're talking about live and have that feed into the rest of the agenda of these, of these Zoom calls. Um, before we get into introducing these five speakers, I would say that it's been a real pleasure for UNICEF and ITU to lead a project on school connectivity over the last year or so, which looks at, first of all, mapping where there is and isn't connectivity using MLAB and other data sources and figuring out how to really understand the situation and then figuring out what kind of digital public goods need to go on top of that connectivity. And so we've worked with many of you and uh, Paula, Mitchell, and Tiziana, it's great to have all of you on this first batch to look at this world as it is and as it emerges. And I wanted to just highlight two questions, which I'm going to lead into this discussion with. Uh, I think Vint described a, a potential set of opportunities for us, and those opportunities also come with darkness. So we know from the game developer community that game traffic on, on servers has increased about 75% in the COVID crisis. That's because everybody's kids are online playing games all the time rather than doing uh, the sort of homework that they're supposed to, maybe. 
But if you're part of the game economy, if you're a kid who's playing a game, if you're one of those people who has access, you also have access to a trillion dollar digital asset class. This is people who are buying new swords for their characters or new shoes or new land online in a digital world. And trillion dollars is a conservative estimate. That means that if you're one of those digital natives that Doreen talked about, if you're lucky enough to have all of this, you will be a royalty in the new world that is to come. If you don't have access, if you're one of the 3.5 billion plus, you will have no access to that new financial set of mechanisms that are for sure emerging. And so we see these opportunities, we see sort of darknesses. Another one is that we've seen uh, over the last few days discussions about contact tracing apps and things that can help people understand where COVID is and where it isn't. Those apps rely on Bluetooth and a, and a good smartphone. And not a lot of people have those. A conservative estimate in the US is that 60% of people have a smartphone of the type that could run these, these applications. And that doesn't even mean that it's been updated and it's ready to go. So if we're looking at the technology that's being developed and whether we want to live in the sort of dystopic panopticon of contact tracing or not, if you don't have the technology that people are developing for, you are also left out of that. You don't have the citizenship to move if you don't have that certificate. You don't have the ability to get payment if you don't have those certificates. And so that leads us again into this very split world. So these are just two, I mean, I was just thinking about, you know, today, how do we open this discussion with, with really important and interesting thoughts from, uh, from our colleagues? And I, I wanted to ask you to sort of have your four minutes of remarks looking at those two questions. One is, does the data, the situation that you see, does it play out to this dystopic kind of world that, that we see from our data? Or is that I'm just being melodramatic? What is, what is the situation that you see right now? And then the second is, what is being done about it? What are the things in your environment, in your company or your country that you see as most appealing that can help us get into that place of sunshine and get ready for the future in a way that we're all together and prepared for? And so uh, with that, I'd like to turn over and we'll, we'll go with uh, Paula first, Mitchell, Joaquin, Carlos, and Tiziana. So that's the order that I will call on you uh, for. And really, you know, asking you to, to look at those two questions with us, <coughs> sharing your views and, and also your hopes for what's coming. Um, with that, Paula is the Minister of IT and Innovation in Rwanda and an excellent champion of both the data that we need uh, to move these questions forward and also the opportunities that digital provides. So Paula, I would turn it over to you as our first speaker. Thanks, uh, Christopher. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to join uh, this series of discussions that are starting today and uh, starting with a very uh, important topic that is really the foundation of um, all the other uh, sessions that we'll have uh, going forward. Very quickly, um, I wanted to, um, as I respond to the two questions, I wanted to just paint a picture, I think, uh, very particularly for a country like ours, and I want to believe uh, it's the same case for uh, many of the developing countries as well as the least developed countries, um, the kind of issues that they are facing today, especially as we all battle with the COVID-19 crisis, is um, one, looking at the surge or the strain that has been put on, uh, on the connectivity infrastructure. And uh, Doreen said it very well. Uh, I mean, when you look at um, um, a, a particular case for Rwanda where we're seeing uh, increasingly in terms of gaps, um, you know, a pattern that is changing when it comes to data consumption and usage, where, um, you know, in the past, uh, the different operators, MNOs, were deploying and provisioning based on demand patterns. And so you'd see a lot of focus and emphasis uh, in the commercial areas, offices. Um, and right now that everyone is working from home, studying from home, um, then you start to see a sudden surge uh, when it comes to residential areas. Um, and so we, we, we've been observing some of the, that, that kind of strain uh, with all the operators, all our partners, you know, doing everything that they can to respond to the sudden demand that has happened um, in certain uh, parts of the, you know, of the country. Um, then the other thing, um, I mean, earlier we did talk about how you have about 3.6 billion, uh, you know, people that remain cut off. And I want to believe that uh, a big chunk of that is made up of, uh, you know, people from developing countries. And so um, while, uh, you know, during such a crisis, you see this uh, problem exacerbated where you see the digital divide even more. Um, I think this is where we're seeing the biggest uh, uh, gaps uh, as we go through uh, such a time. 
Um, of course, it has what you would call, um, you know, other aspects that you look at. You don't look just at the connectivity. Um, I mean, a country like ours where you're looking at a 97 internet penetration, broadband connectivity is still low. But it's not just, um, you know, having that infrastructure. It's also thinking about uh, having the right skills to be able to completely move and shift into remote working and studying online, having the right tools, the devices, but also looking at the costs, which could still be prohibitive in many cases. And so this is really the scale um, of, uh, of issues that we are dealing with as we try to think about the current situation of connectivity uh, in, in, in our country, but also in many other countries like ours as we uh, during such a time. Um, very quickly, I also wanted to even uh, sort of touch on what are we currently doing to respond to some of these things. So there's one fast tracking some of the initiatives that we already had, which is, uh, you know, improving broadband access um, in rural areas. And what we are looking at is um, um, as we increase this, you're prioritizing places like healthcare centers. You're also um, looking at uh, uh, urban areas where um, you, know, you can no longer rely on mobile networks um, and what we are pushing for actively and, and mobilizing a, a lot of our partners is to now um, consider very urgently the ability to do uh, fiber to the home uh, so that, you know, many of these residential areas are. Paula, we lost you. We lost you at residential areas and you are seem to be on mute now. Go ahead. Oh, OK. No, I noticed some, well, it was saying I was muted by the host. So that was the final, that was my final point to sort of like talk about those, uh, um, you know, interventions that we are now uh, taking into consideration to respond to some of the challenges that we have. Thank you. Uh, Paula, thank you so That's much. Fine. And I think that when we've been talking with you as well about um, looking at connectivity and providing that data, it seemed that really lined up with Vince's comments about how important that data is. Uh, of where there is and isn't connectivity, you're really able to play a lead role. And so maybe we can come back to that a little bit in the questions and discussions. The other part that you, point that you highlighted feeds in really well to um, some of the work we've done with Mitchell Baker. Mitchell's the CEO and chairwoman of Mozilla Foundation, CEO of Mozilla Company, um, and also a friend and ally as we've been thinking about digital public goods or digital public assets, what we provide on top of that connectivity. And I think that in terms of being thoughtful about the class of open source digital public services that we need to provide and, and find resource and so on. I couldn't imagine anybody better to give the remarks uh, on that following what Paula said as well. So Mitchell, um, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thank you for the gracious invitation. I'm honored as well um, to join this group. And I think Chris, I'll just dive in with your question first, uh, which I, I'll, I'll rephrase as, um, how do we think about the possibility of the dark future and, and can we be optimistic and, and what could we do to be more optimistic? And I'll tie that a little bit to Vince's comments, um, not to be flippant, but there is the phrase, never waste a crisis. And so since we're in the middle of this crisis, uh, I, I would say, I, I think the dark future is easy uh, and it's certainly an easy to imagine in front of us, uh, both for the reasons we've described before uh, and because if you think back to uh, pre-COVID, there was a very active global social discussion about the nature of the internet and technology and its impact on society. And so right now we're focused on data, or you mentioned the um, tracking, uh, COVID, who had COVID tracking that. But, but until a few months ago, the social conversation was much, much broader and encompassed a, you know, a range of topics. And so I think if that gets lost, we will have missed an opportunity here. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the risk of being, uh, you know, overly optimistic, I, I will say that, that crisis does cause change. And so as, as human beings and as actors, we can affect that change, whether it's a change towards a darker world faster or whether we actually don't waste this crisis and, and we can make progress towards, um, I call it a brighter world faster, faster, one in which the digital public goods you mentioned um, the importance of those become clear and we're galvanized to provide the resources and the focus on building access and the necessary abilities and, and content and such on top of that. Uh, and, and so with that, I'll describe a few areas um, a little more specifically. One, of course, is access, access to everyone. 
And so if we're going to make use of this crisis and, and, and move towards um, something that's not so dark as it could be, you know, the, the prioritization of telecommunications infrastructure to reach everyone is something that we could really focus on right now. The current you know, regulatory, financial, and, and tech infrastructure, we've seen it's not well suited to access for everyone um, who, in remote and sparsely populated areas, and, and sometimes not well suited to the degree of broadband we need to actually live well online. So that's an area that uh, a focus uh, where uh, focus today can make a big difference. For example, um, the question of uh, spectrum allocation or wireless spectrum to low cost operators um, and enabling new business models in, in rural areas where connectivity remains low. Uh, and so I'll just mix in what Mozilla is doing rather than just you know, listed at the end. So for example, we're working with the African Telecommunications Union to address exactly that kind of question and see what kind of um, policy and approaches we can um, devise that, that enable the business models that make it sensible. And in addition to the business models, um, policies and practices that enable community networks and co-ops and small, small ISPs. Um, because that, that range, we've seen that that range can be effective. And, and, and certainly uh, it's clear that you know, the high cost model you know, of, of network operators is difficult to scale. And the second piece uh, would be investing in people, right? And that is people, the content and education that Vint mentioned, also the set of people who are on the ground and understand the internet network architecture, how to build and run and maintain uh, that content. And then the third piece is the kinds of choices for consumers, applications for people to choose that treat data well. Thank you. Super, thank you, Mitchell. Um, it seems like we are, and thank you everybody for, for being so time conscious as well. This is really great and it's gonna give us a good, good ability to chat later, but it seems like we're, we're swirling around a few issues around regulatory, around incentives and entrepreneurship and the services on top of the digital as well. Um, from our next speaker, um, from Joaquim, who's the Global External Affairs Director at Voda Phone, um, we'd be very interested as well to hear from the perspective of an MNO, of, from the operator side, uh, where you come in on these types of issues that are being raised on this call. Um, Joaquim, over to you. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I will touch upon three areas that I think is absolutely essential, which uh, we have uh, um, worked on and will work on very, very hard. Uh, as you know, we are in the second epicenter after uh, China, which was Europe. So unfortunately, we've got uh, practice very early on on the type of challenges you're faced with. And that triggered basically actions around the three parameters. Number one, networks. Traffic is up massively. We're talking about a 50% increase in fixed in Europe. Kenya, after the lockdown, 35% increase in mobile and by Safaricom. And Vodafone has around one-fifth of all the world's internet traffic running us on our, its network, which is currently being handled by a few thousand households, living rooms, bedrooms across Europe as opposed to offices with your normal way of doing things. So this is enormous pressure on the network, and that's where all the effort goes. I'm, I must say that uh, we somewhat referred to content moderation. Of course, we have highlighted the importance of traffic management and stuff like that to just make sure that everyone can rely on, uh, on, on, on the Internet at this point. Second one is critical services. So um, this is a space where clearly... Over the last sort of six weeks in Europe, you probably have had more digitization of healthcare than the previous 20 years combined. So uh, what we have done is that we ensure that the health, we expanded capacity very rapidly for health, education, work from home. First week of uh, COVID-19 in, um, in Europe, we basically moved two and, two and a half million uh, um, employees, previously never worked from home, to a home and work office environment. A big concern we have here is the SMEs falling behind, so we're working on how to drive, accelerate digital adoption by them. And in the health space, it's all about making sure that you have, it's not only about access to internet and information, you can also use, uh, set up call centers and the like, so that people can call in on the uh, 2G phones, which we're doing across AMA. A very big concern here, and I'm happy that someone mentioned it, is disinformation. This is going insane, frankly. Uh, 
uh, combined with another thing, which is a 300% increase in phishing attacks. So organized crime, as well as uh, conspiracy theories are now running rampant, and we do need to figure out a way of handling them. The third bucket of uh, issues that we deal with is what I call insights data and other applications. So uh, clearly we sit on a massive amount of data of how people move around. So if you wanna have effective containment measures, uh, we will be able to advise governments on an aggregated anonymous basis, and that's the key words here, uh, exactly to what extent social distancing is actually happening in a country. So we're doing that uh, country by country. It's very complicated to do this, very labor intensive, and mainly it's prevented by regulation, not by uh, technical capabilities. Secondly, we are getting into contact tracing. So we have joined the Bluetooth Alliance in Europe, helping them to develop contact tracing. It's absolutely correct. It's not an AMAP solution or an Africa solution. And we're very concerned about the attempts across certain countries to copy the lawful intercept type of framework into contact tracing, which is treating uh, those that are unfortunate among us that get infected as criminals. So we have pushed very strong for a sort of privacy preserve approach on this. Final point, just to say, um, I think it's very important. I think there is an opportunity out of this crisis, and even if it's a very, very tough crisis for everyone involved, uh, I think there is a reset in our understanding of what do we mean by societal digital resilience. And I mean that at individual level, at business level, as well as government level. And for me, I think we really do need to s take a step back for concretely revisit exactly how we run spectrum auctions across the territory. We need to drive in a completely different affordability of the services, to accelerate digital applications in education and health, improve security for sure. And there are many other things that I think we can do, not least in the area of digitizing SMEs. Thank you. Perfect. Joaquin, thank you. You came in eight seconds before the red card there. So um, this is clearly highlighting also the potential for these, these uh, cross-sectoral partnerships. And in addition to the areas you mentioned, I think that the questions as well of child protection and digital safety online are becoming uh, keenly in focus. So we look forward to hearing about that from some of the later speakers and from the audience. Um, our next speaker is, uh, is Carlos, the Commissioner and Director of the Communications Regulation Commission in Colombia. Um, where, in fact, we did quite a bit of our initial school mapping and school connectivity mapping work about two years ago. Um, Carlos, your, your work and the ministries involved in that have been tremendously supportive of this idea of universal and, universal and affordable access, uh, and it would be a pleasure to hear from you uh, now about these two issues that, that we've raised on the call. Over to you. Thank you, Christopher. And first of all, uh, good morning, and I hope that you are well in this difficult moment in the world. And I want to answer your question, analyzing the different measures that we made during the crisis, and to clarify where is our role from the CRC, Communication Regulation Commission, in Colombia, because we are the only regulator for competition in telecommunication markets, quality service, and protection of users. It also assigns us a task that we must develop, for example, simplify our regulation, promoting investment, guaranteeing technological updating, and in general, promoting the deployment to the telecommunication infrastructure. For that reason, that has let us play an important role in this policy and to consider a regulatory agenda that contributes to the closing connectivity gap that is today a real need for our countries. Uh, about data, we, we still have an average 40% of citizens without broadband internet connectivity. That implies a great challenge especially in rural areas in our countries. In 2020, the Commission designed a very ambitious regulatory agenda. Many of these issues will have to be accelerated over time due to the coronavirus crisis, but others will have to, to be postponed because they involve file work with citizens and homes. And now I, I would like to present some topics that we believe are important to continue developing the connectivity policy in my country. But before, I want to present some decisions we made to guarantee the provision of the communication service during the coronavirus emergency in Colombia. Important steps have been taken to ensure that people are connected during the crisis, but it doesn't resolve the delay in the deployment of connectivity infrastructure or close the gap. People need measures to guarantee teleworking, online education, e-commerce, but in our countries, not all jobs can be digitized. That's the problem. The problem remains the same and cannot be resolved during the crisis. For that reason, rather the medium-term plans are being developed must be followed through. 
we don't have immediate measures that we can solve the problem of the connectivity gap, but we can guarantee some seats to some citizens can develop their economic activity, education from home, and in other hand, accelerate the plans for 4G deployment, for example. Another issue in this moment is the payment capacity of users. It is a general problem that during the crisis gets bigger in Latin American countries. And now with the crisis, the measures that we made are, for example, reduction of rates by removing taxes for some plans and services, guarantee a minimum capacity for internet browsing and test message, guarantee free access to some minimum web pages of government service, health, education, uh, especially for people with lower income, and uh, new deadlines to pay internet service bill, for example. And in the other hand, reduce the time to run license for infrastructure deployment and installation of telecommunication infrastructure, make it easier for internet providers to offer new plans and to have new users. And I believe that after the coronavirus crisis, we have to continue with our regulatory agenda with important topics, roadmap to promote the modernization of mobile networks, our 5G plan, for example, because as you see, we have different activities for, for, G, for 5G. For example, study the regulatory condition for the 5G deployment, <laughs> infrastructure for 5G quality service, etc. Uh, I finally, I believe that we are defining up our first regulatory sandbox in telecommunication. I believe that is import that's important because we need to improve the investment in our country. And finally, our challenge is now greater. ICT is now a great hope for the world and for the economy of our country. Thank you. Carlos, thank you as well. Didn't even get to this, but I love raising it anyway. Um, the issues, I mean, again, so this is this regulatory question, and then the issues of financial inclusion um, seem to be really key in what we build even more strongly going forward and what kind of infrastructure we provide as we connect more and more public utilities, public buildings, and so on, and what kind of financial arbitrage we can do as we move that connectivity out to more disconnected areas. And I know that's been a, a real focus of some of the work uh, that we've done with uh, Mintic and others in, in Colombia. So uh, we'd love to hear more from you and over the next uh, few weeks about that financial side as well. It's also a great segue uh, into the work that Tiziana has been leading and that her teams have been working on um, as the director of ICT and disaster uh, risk reduction in SCAP in, in Southeast Asia and in, uh, it was, it's very interesting because the conversation that we had with Tiziana and Fabrizio started in uh, Almaty in Kazakhstan a few months ago. And it was so clear that as they're looking uh, to provide financing solutions that cross Central Asia, for example, and look at cross-border financial inclusion, identity, connectivity and disaster risk reduction, all of these things come together. Um, that was before COVID and now we're really delighted Tiziana, to hear from you and to ask you for a little bit of the perspective on sort of the, the Asian digital connectivity, digital divide and how it's playing out in COVID and how ESCAP's making specific recommendations to governments within this, this framing. Um, so Tiziana, delighted to have you as our final speaker for these opening remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. And uh, I'd like to start off by uh, thanking USG Hochschild and ASG Bogdan for the kind invitation. And um, Christopher, to you, uh, my compliments for the progress you have made uh, on GIGA uh, since we last met uh, in Almaty. I, I went through the notes that you circulated earlier, and as I was going through them, I thought, well, COVID-19 has really made your initiative on getting every school connected to the internet an essential, essential project. And, and so I was pleased to see that progress and you have our support for uh, continuous progress in that project. Um, so, um, Christopher, uh, before I talk about the digital divide, I did want to maybe make one, you know, positive comment about, uh, you know, one, one good thing that has come out of COVID. And, and that is uh, something perhaps that is very uh, particular to Asia Pacific. And that is that there is a, a very high consumer confidence in, in the region. And increasingly digitally 
savvy shoppers. And so notwithstanding, you know, the terrible, the, you know, the slowdown in economic growth, the disruption of the supply chains, we have actually seen a very dynamic e-commerce market. And that in many cases, uh, you know, sales are up by 60% or by, you know, between 30 to 60 percent in particular on food delivery business and uh, medical medical equipment. So that's, that's one positive thing. But of course, the digital divide has been accelerating in the region. Um, half still remain offline, as has been repeatedly said. Um, and, you know, notwithstanding the rapid advances that have been made in more recent years in terms of bringing mobile connectivity at affordable prices to more and more people, um, these mobile networks are the low data transfer networks. Um, and so it's COVID has once again underlined that it's those that have access to fixed lines that are able to use the internet as the lifeline that it has emerged to be. Um, and so, you know, my key message, I think, is that while we have known for a long time and we have been advocating for a long time that um, maintaining the momentum in investments in uh, in, in uh, telecom networks uh, is not enough, and that accelerated momentum is needed if we are to meet the surge in future in the new demand that will be generated by frontier technologies. This has become all the more urgent, um, given our the experience that has emerged from. COVID. And uh, governments have a clear leadership role uh, to play in this. And, and so there are two uh, proposals that ESCAP, uh, or two recommendations that ESCAP has been making to governments to help minimize the costs of investing. And one is uh, the DIG1, use many times uh, recommendation which is really the co-deployment of backbone fiber optic cable along other passive infrastructure networks, such as highways, roads, railways, and so on. Around 80 to 90% of the costs related to digging and excavation um, for the deployment of fiber optic cable is related to public works and to obtaining rights of way. So if governments are obtaining rights of way and digging to build a road, to put down power lines, then, then co-deploying with fiber optic cable would be a big cost saving. And so borrowing the phrase from Doreen on, we need a big dig, we need a big dig, we need to dig once, use many times. And then my final point is, can we push once again for access to the internet as a fundamental human right? Thank you. Thank you, Tiziana. Um, I think that those comments are very much also in line with what we heard in our discussions around uh, the high-level panel recommendations, um, particularly 1A on infrastructure and 1B around the utility. And so it seems like those five or five speakers really round out an, a very pertinent, relevant, and actionable um, set of opportunities for us. And I'd be very interested in our wrap-up and as we go forward to think through how those of us who were involved with the high-level panel follow-up can even take some of these things, make them concrete, or give examples based on what you've provided. And I know that a lot of this is being captured in the chat. What um, we'd like to do also is, in interest of time, to sort of hop directly into a set of smaller interventions specifically focused on uh, things that are happening on specific initiatives. So there will be a set of five or six speakers who will get two minutes and be subjected to the same brutal timekeeping, so apologies from me, um, to give us an update on work that they're doing or where they particularly come in from their personal and professional level into this question. Um, I have a list that goes Amandeep, John, Bruna, Dennis, Fatima, Pavel, Diego here, uh, sorry, Enrica, Diego here. 
If there are other people, please contact Zheng He and we'll make sure that you're slotted in. If you'd like to come into the open questions area, please put that in the chat box and Zheng He will uh, work to make sure that your questions are included. Cool, super cool. Um, Amandeep, you yep. were a leader of the, uh, the high-level panel on digital cooperation and also look extensively at questions of the utility of this connectivity, particularly for public health. Uh, and we'd love to have you give the first two-minute um, specific response to this sit-in and, and hear from you uh, about how you see connectivity and COVID. Over to you, Amdi. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, honored to be on this call. Uh, in addition to the excellent points that previous speakers have made with regard to connectivity, the shadow side and the light side, I like to emphasize that this uh, crisis has shown us that wherever connectivity has been supplemented with a base of digital public goods, uh, its impact, its positive impact has been amplified. So if, for example, the work on digital financial inclusion of the past few years had not been done in India, it would have been impossible today to channel these emergency cash subsidies to hundreds of millions of people at one go. So there is the internet connectivity aspect, but there is a larger aspect of digital connectivity and digital public goods, which we must uh, keep in mind. And this was one of the insights from the, the panel as well. Uh, the second point about uh, the, uh, the current use of uh, digital networks and data, uh, you mentioned, Chris, the uh, tracing apps. Uh, uh, the evidence so far is that they are not playing a decisive role. Uh, so they, they play uh, somewhat of a psychological role. Uh, they could eventually become useful provided the data that's coming out of them uh, is channeled in an anonymized way uh, into other uh, 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 data sets. So it's combined with other data sets uh, to help health authorities uh, determine what's likely to be the burden on the health systems uh, through the uh, cascade of care that follows an infection to help public authorities discuss how to allocate resources and model the impact of interventions uh, on the management of the crisis. Uh, so I'll end by uh, just one point, which is that uh, so far, I think this crisis is showing us more of the brighter side uh, and less of the darker side. And we need to think about how to take this into the future by focusing on more collaboration, more digital co cooperation around uh, data. Thanks. Thank you uh, for your comments. And I think that um, in part of the discussions around our, our response to the high-level panel, we've looked at what specifically those digital public goods can be. Um, I wanted to turn over to John uh, from UNHCR, the Chief Innovation Officer, to give us his two-minute update as well and to see where, where he sits on that spectrum of dark to light and what we are all able to do uh, in the coming weeks and months. John, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chris. And yes, to clarify, I'm leading up the Connectivity for Refugees initiative within UNHCR. Um, obviously, when we're talking about connectivity, the needs of the most marginalized should be at the forefront of our minds. And with 71 million displaced persons, um, you know, the needs there are obviously massive. Uh, research between uh, the UNHCR, UNHCR has found that um, uh, displaced populations in rural areas are usually about half as likely as hosting communities to have access to connectivity. Um, there are a number of barriers to this, including legal and regulatory barriers that won't be necessarily present to citizens based on uh, the identity and credentials of recognition of these possibly displaced persons. And um, I think we also need to look at the fact that this is not a homogenous group. Within these communities, there are obviously uh, divide such as gender divide, marginalized persons such as people with disabilities, these needs need to be addressed. And I think that, um, you know, when we're talking about this debate, this map topic of digital inclusion is really paramount. We want to ensure that uh, those of the most mar marginalized communities, including refugees and forcibly displaced persons, can be considered within the, the, both the legal and regulatory frameworks for access globally, but also that uh, interventions from private sector providers such as mobile network operators consider these groups in, in their interventions. Maybe. Thank you, John. You came in before the yellow card, so I had to figure out where the unmute button was. Um, we, we have, I think that this, the question of how we engage with and make sure that 
the affordability around access is actually affordable for the world's most vulnerable populations and that the services are not only usable uh, by them, but also created with and, and created to create capacity among vulnerable populations is really key. We have two speakers now from Brazil who we hope will give us some insight uh, into that, particularly on sort of if, on the regulatory side and, and entrepreneurial side. Uh, first from Bruna. Bruna, over to you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the space, Christopher. Um, I'm doing a work for Coding Rights, which is an NGO that's um, discussing some of those subjects here in Brazil. And um, in terms to general um, access and connection, I just wanted to point out that generally um, internet broadband connection in Brazil, it's still underway of implementation. It's not universal. It's not massively implemented. And we continue to perceive some advances on the number of Brazilians who access the internet, who have access to the internet, but they're mostly um, on the level of the mobile access. Um, also on that note, we, we also would like to point out the, the need to recognize community networks as a complement to those efforts by the public and the private sector in connecting the this, what we're calling the next billion or connecting whatever Brazilians are left outside. Um, our levels of connection to the internet are around 79.9% of the population, but we still, um, considering that it's mostly um, mobile access, we do still face um, those issues when it comes to access to information and how limited the, the mobile access and data caps can influence um, this full fruition of internet access. Um, and lastly, um, just point out some current draft bills on, under discussion around our Congress. Um, we finally seem to be leaning towards um, this acknowledgement of access to internet as an essential service. So, and, and as a right, and as a tool for, for completing your rights. So um, we have a few initiatives here around um, prohibitions of suspensions or cuts at the service provision, and, and I know this is something people around this call are also mapping. So thank you for this space. Bruna, thank you very much and look forward to hearing and seeing some of the um, legislative pieces maybe put in the chat on the side so we can track those as well. Uh, Dennis, I know that from the Lehman Foundation you've been leading, in addition to thinking about the content deployed in uh, Brazil, also thinking about some of the financing for connectivity and doing some really innovative work there. And we're, it's just been a, such a pleasure to work with you and your team over the last few months. Uh, we'd welcome you to give some of your comments as well into the regional situation and the work that you're doing. Over to you, Dennis. Thank you, uh, Chris. Pleasure to be here. So I'm, I'm from the Lemon Foundation from Brazil. Our main focus is to ensure all Brazilian, all 40 million public school Brazilian students uh, have access to high quality learning all, all the time. So during the crisis, this is a especially more sensitive issue. As Bruna said, uh, about 79% of them have access to some sort of mobile, mostly connectivity at home. Um, so what, what we did is we organized over the past three weeks a huge task force with federal, state, local governments, over 30 foundations working together uh, to put together basically two things. Organize content aligned to the national learning standards that can be developed through an app. Uh, this app, it, we negotiated with the telcos here in Brazil to be a zero rating app. So either the government pays for the data or they do it for free or subsidized, but the user doesn't pay for the data. So that's critical. Even if people have access to mobile internet, they cannot pay for the data, right? Most of the users are prepaid uh, who don't want to, uh, who cannot afford to use the data to education or might not choose to use the data for education. So by putting all the content inside an app, including live, uh, uh, live lessons, including interaction with the teachers, uh, including exercises, frequency monitoring, so all of that, uh, the experience comes from the experience of the Amazon in Brazil where they uh, traditionally have to use distance learning. So it's the same kind of app and now it's being deployed all over the country. Over 5 million students already have access to the app. Um, but the plan is to the, to the end of next week to be able to cover all of them. Last point is, someone mentioned on the chat, we also built a, a, a chain of network of television stations. Over 30 TVs are part of this effort. Television reaches almost 100% of networks. So that's another key, I think, uh, partner in delivering high-quality education for all with equity during the crisis. Thank you. Dennis, thank you very much. And I know that uh, Rwanda and many others are looking at that television access layer 
So it may be another piece of follow-up that we can do as a community to highlight lessons from that and what's, what's working and what's not, as well as some of the content that's working the best. We have uh, four more speakers before the end of this section. Uh, Fatima from Microsoft, I will turn it over to you. Microsoft's Airbank Initiative, and I'm based out in Seattle in Washington State. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Airband, we're a part of the technology and corporate responsibility focus of Microsoft, and our mission is to make affordable broadband internet access a reality for underserved communities around the world, with a particular focus on rural areas, both in the U.S. and globally. We work with local internet service providers and, or airband partners for a lot of our projects and our partners have been a tremendous asset during this time in the midst of the pandemic. They're conducting their essential business, ensuring that rural communities in particular have vital access to broadband as well as broadband enabled services right now. Uh, Aside from reporting higher than ever network demand and connectivity usage uh, due to school and business closures, our partners have developed very creative solutions for the communities they serve, like removing data caps, providing free high-speed broadband access for student income eligible households, um, construction of hundreds of public Wi-Fi spots in public areas with parking, such as fairgrounds, so community members are able to access the internet while practicing social distancing and this has provided access to community services like distance learning, telemedicine, telework, filling critical forms such as unemployment applications and other solutions that are necessary for uh, modern life. Um, in addition to connectivity, one thing that I'd like to highlight is that Microsoft has also made Teams, uh, which is a software uh, for a secure communications platform like multi-party chats, audio calling, video calling, um, for remote collaboration. And in terms of our initial learnings that I brought about by the pandemic, I think this really presents an opportunity for those of us who are working to close the broadband gap to move quickly to advance policy, infrastructure, and tools that will really address this urgent need now and permanently. Thank you. Super. Fatima, thank you very much. And in fact, we'll be hearing a little bit about some of the work on advancing policy uh, and regulatory, I hope, uh, from Pavel. Pavel is the chairman of, uh, deputy chairman of, I always get your title wrong, Pavel. You're the, as far as I'm concerned, you're the guy in charge for all of the digital connectivity work that's happening in Kazakhstan uh, at Zerde, the National Infocom holding, and a partner as we're thinking about not only the regulatory, but also the financing part of connectivity. Um, Pavel, with apologies uh, for butchering your title, over to you uh, for your intervention. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to join this webinar to share the Kazakhstan's case study. Uh, so even though Kazakhstan has a fairly stable and high-speed internet, the increases number of users due to lockdown has led to the few uh, network failures. For example, as the fact that distance education for Kazakh children in the first few days, as well uh, load the e-government portal due to the mass influx of users. This was a pretty obvious as which, uh, with introduction of quarantine, most of the people went online. By the beginning of April, traffic of the networks of telecom operators in the country increased by 28%, both of international communications channels and the local resources. However, half of the internet traffic that could load our external communication channels is localized in Kazakhstan. This is significantly improved of the content for the many resources, specifically uh, educational one. Secondly, I would like to give a few examples of how the internet and technology helped to adapt the new conditions. By the president's order, the Ministry of Health, uh, together with Kazakhstan IT companies, has established IT task force that has developed and launched a number of IT solutions uh, against coronavirus. For example, online questionnaires that allow uh, to pass an express test and uh, identify the symptoms of coronavirus for preliminary self-diagnosis or mobile app that control movements of person who are in contact with the infected people. Also, the Kazakhstani mobile operators have provided free communications uh, with internet and mobile for all uh, medical uh, uh, staff. In order to reduce the social context, all public service centers in Kazakhstan have been handled close, and it's, instead people have the opportunity to receive public services through the e-governmental portal, one of the most demanded public services for our citizens 
uh, issuance of uh, electronic or digital signature, we also moved it online. I mean, for a lot, uh, technology is well known, but it need time just to uh, introduce uh, this kind of uh, in distant uh, solutions. The cloud document management for 20,000 government employees was introduced, and now they're able to uh, work remotely. School children and a lot of examples was given uh, with a blended learning together with the TV channels and internet channels was also introduced and I think it's uh, uh, a lot of uh, great uh, learnings can be uh, done after uh, at least one month of these uh, options. So we are ready and uh, we believe that uh, all the governments well, you're not, you're, should you're share, now, so. uh, yes, to, to share this kind of experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you uh, as, a, as a partner in these initiatives, and thank you so much for the digitalization work that you're doing. Our second to last intervention will come from Enrica, uh, the chair of the ETC and director of IT uh, at World Food Program, and also a huge supporter of connectivity in some of the most difficult situations in the world. Enrica, over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, I'll just uh, give a few comments on uh, maybe on risk communications. It was interesting hearing about the connected. Um, as you rightfully pointed out, uh, the Wolf program operates in a number of countries where there is a where the digital divide is pervasive. There's a lot of non-connected. However, a lot of non-connected may be not connected through the um, what we what we expect in terms of broadband connectivity and uh, um, and uh, but there's still a lot of connect connection that go that happens at community level around uh, life-saving and life-affirming uh, communication through uh, community radios through televisions so we basically try to use every connectivity options to get to in the hands of those who need the, of the most vulnerable people um, information that are that, that is uh, reliable rapid uh, and regular, um, so that they can make more informed decisions about uh, about uh, about the future. So, as I said, communication is both uh, life affirming um, for people to to make their own decisions and life savings um, not only for the people we serve but also for the humanitarians themselves. So, we at times operate in very uh, complex situations where we may not, even as humanitarians, have access to uh, advanced technologies. So, we look at opportunities of leveraging. Um, you know, less less uh, advanced communication tools to to be able to uh, operate in in complex situations. We saw, as as we said, for the people that uh, that we serve, uh, the most important thing, the most important work that we do is really put um, try to support the 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 health sector in putting reliable information in the hands who need it most to trying to avoid the challenges that we saw during the West Africa Ebola virus disease outbreak in 2014. That's all I wanted to say, thank you. Enrica, thank you very much. And I think that we've seen this merging of health and education and financial services coming really to a clear point here, uh, which wasn't, I think, the case. We didn't have that capacity during Ebola. So there, there may be an opportunity there as well. And thank you for the ETC's leadership on, on that type of response. Our last speaker uh, in this, before we hand it uh, back over, over to Alex for some final thoughts and then to, uh, to Doreen uh, and Fabrizio as well to close, uh, is Diego. Diego from the government of Mexico will give us a situation update from Mexico City. Um, and Diego, we would be very happy to hear from you as our closing intervention of this period. Over to you. Thank you, Chris. And rather than uh, talking about the uh, current situation in Mexico, I will speak about uh, the, the efforts uh, uh, of Mexico when it comes to the, uh, advancing uh, the conversation on digital technologies uh, at the UN. And, um, and I think this is important, and I would like to thank for convening this conversation because I think it is the beginning to uh, start talking about the different initiatives and the different findings that we have been uh, uh, encountering uh, in the different uh, groups on the follow-up and recommendations of the, of the high-level panel on digital cooperation. Mexico has been championing, along with UN Women, a recommendation 1C and 1D on digital inclusion and metrics. So I really think that this conversation is really helpful in trying to see the connections that we have. Uh, for instance, uh, among the, the, and I think it is important, these uh, different groups, 
uh, because we are talking about 50% of the world population being offline, uh, but actually when we go into the details of the different groups in vulnerable situations, those figures raise. And uh, when we're talking about women and girls, when we're talking about migrants, refugees, IDPs, older persons, youth, children, persons with disabilities, rural populations, and indigenous peoples, these figures raise, and I think it is, it is important to, um, uh, to look at them. Uh, the other element that is important is that we found when we were doing the mapping of the, of the different initiatives is that there are scattered efforts. And I think that here is very useful to have these conversations, but at the same time, one of the conclusions of the, of the, of the work of the, of the group uh, was that it, it is important to have an online platform uh, on this particular element to try to see what are the best practices uh, with the different issues. And just to close, um, I think that another element that would be important to uh, consider is the discussion on telemedicine, particularly in a situation and a crisis that is arising from the issue of a virus, it will be relevant to talk about it. So I will keep it here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Diego. Well, I have um, really enjoyed hearing from all of you, and I hope I've well, this is the most difficult job because I offend all of my friends and then everybody else feels like I'm just a vicious moderator, but we've managed to keep ourselves somewhat on time. Uh, to, and what I'd really like to do is to use this as an opportunity to consolidate some of that, as Diego, as you just said, and make sure that we're making available as a community the resources around data, around regulations, financing, and so on, that we heard from all of you as being fundamental to what we build afterwards. Um, thank you so much for letting me moderate you. I promise that next time somebody can do the same horrific thing to me. I wanted to hand back over to my co-moderator, Alex, uh, for his wrap up, and then we will uh, close with some words from Doreen and Fabrizio. But all of you, it's been a pleasure, and I couldn't be more appreciative of working with all of you than, than I am. So thank you, Alex, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, before I do a, a very brief summary of the conversation, I wanted to invite Vice Minister Yamada, uh, if she's still on the phone, if she wanted to add a quick intervention, maybe as we get towards the end of the call. So just calling to see if she is still on the line. Okay, it may have, uh, it's quite late over in Japan. So maybe, uh, I, I think I would just summarize uh, on the following. Uh, I think, hello. Oh, hello, Vice Minister Yamada, please, over to you, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. It is almost midnight uh, in Japan. And so I'm very sleepy, but I enjoyed the, uh, the conversation and all the uh, presentation very much. And I found that again that the uh, now the issue of the connectivity is the issue of life now. So and uh, so uh, so we have many experiences and uh, for the next uh, uh, with with near uh, I'd like to introduce many uh, Japanese initiatives. But uh, so this time I learned a lot and thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Minister. So I think my, my summary here is that, I mean, on a broad level, we covered um, the big topics of data. There seems to be a good movement about how do we make data available. Um, we talked about safety. We touched on that, the safe side or the, or the, or the non-dark side of the internet. And I think that's worth more discussion in a future call. Overall, everyone recognized the importance of access. Uh, how can we make it better, more sustainable, uh, more faster? And then finally, I think what was really interesting in the chat, as I was reading all the chats, and also the individual interventions at the country level, is there is a huge amount of resources, both platforms that are collecting best practices and regulatory guidance notes and advice on how this should be done or that. And equally on the countryside, I mean, I was fascinated to hear some of these examples of what some countries are doing. And more importantly, or equally importantly, what are the governments and the rec operators and the community of stakeholders in those countries doing? Because I would suspect if you're a minister uh, or a government official or a leader in one country, knowing what another country is doing and using that as an example helps move things in your own country. So I think really what I would suggest we do as, a, as the moderators and as a, as a, as a high-level panel uh, follow-up to this group is we have to log all of this all these uh, links that are being put on the chats, as well as individuals who have presented what they're doing in their countries. Um, I guess the invitation is to send to He. We're gonna use what's on the chat already, but if, if you also have in additional uh, examples or case studies of, of materials that you've done in your country, send that. And um, I'll just make the commitment now, and we'll have to figure out with Zhonghi how to do it, is we, want, we need to catalog all this, because I think what this call has shown is we have a great group of people who are all doing great things and we need to be sharing. And if we can already get started on that, that's already one uh, very positive outcome um, from this call. So uh, with that, um, we, have, we have six minutes left. So I'm going to hand back over to 
uh, Fabrizio and Doreen to close us off three minutes each to get us done on time. So maybe Fabrizio, I'll go in reverse order over to you first and then over to Doreen to, to close us. Thank you. So thank you and thank uh, Chris for the excellent moderation. I think this was a tremendously rich debate. I think we did a deep dive into some of the problems. First, infrastructure, whether it's present or absence and its resilience. Uh, second, the issue of adequate regulation that um, is conducive. Three, the key issue of affordability, which we keep coming back to. I mean, it's not just presence of infrastructure. Access has to be affordable. And that's particularly relevant, and that point was highlighted from Brazil and elsewhere, that there's affordable access in data for education. Um, and then the issue also came up that not all jobs are, can be digitalized, and that's something that we need to be mindful of. And then fifth, the issue of security. I mean, the increases in phishing, 300% increase of phishing, said by Vodafone with a 50% increase in use. So that shows criminals are outpacing the increased use. And then, of course, related to security is the whole issue of how data can be better used for public health purposes, but at the same time in an anonymized way that doesn't incur on people's um, privacy. It's very clear that these problems that have come to light, many of them don't have quick fixes. Others do, like regulation. But what is also clear is that the only way to find fixes if through these sorts of multi-stakeholder discussions that we have here, bringing together the private sector, civil society, government, and exchanging best practices and best approaches. So I think if nothing else is validated, it's this approach that is also very much at the heart of the Secretary General's approach. And I think if we continue working on these lines and we build coalitions and alliances, we can address these problems and get to the ultimate aim that Vint set out at the beginning, which is reliable, safe, affordable, accessible, useful, and sustainable access. Thank you. So I'll, I'll jump in, but I think Fabrizio, you said it uh, very well. Um, I just want to thank everyone. This has really been an incredibly rich discussion. Uh, this is the beginning, though, a beginning of a, of a series. So many of the, the comments that were raised will be taken up in the next four webinars. Um, the next one is, is next week on, on April 22nd. Uh, we had, I think at one point, some 280 participants uh, from, of course, all corners of the world. And I thank the Vice Minister for staying up with us so late. Um, that's great. Um, but for me, what I really took from this discussion, there was a lot, as Fabrizio mentioned, on the negative side. So uh, you've all stressed the importance of bridging the digital divide. And the fact that there is a divide is really exacerbating inequalities in this difficult time. The security issues, huge, huge challenge there. We need to keep cybercrime, uh, cybersecurity at the top of our agenda. And on the chat, a number of you have also raised the, the child online protection issue. So uh, we do need to keep that in mind, the misinformation, disinformation as well. Um, and then on, on the opportunity or on the positive side, I hate to say positive side, but let's say the opportunity side, um, I got to see Fabrizio and Vint two days in a row, <laughs> which is great, so that's nice. Um, but I think on, really on the positive side is what we've seen during the, the, the course of this call is that the spirit of collaboration is there. Uh, the, the, the willingness to partner is also there. Uh, so many of you have, have shared the great work that you're doing either with partners or on your own. Uh, and that's really terrific. And so we need to, um, as Mitchell said, we can't waste this crisis. We really need to take advantage um, of, of this moment and, and, and forge uh, forward on connectivity. The other good thing is that no one will ever doubt the importance of connectivity after this crisis. Um, and again, Mitchell, with what you said, cri the crisis causes change and it is in our power to make progress towards uh, taking the best of this crisis. So again, let's make sure that we, uh, we advance and, and really galvanize commitment around infrastructure and move that forward into concrete projects uh, so that we can close the digital divide. Um, and finally, just to invite you to join us next week on the 22nd for our next um, uh, dialogue, we will be looking at connectivity best practices with a question mark. Um, and so I hope that you will, will all join us for that, uh, that discussion. 
Uh, and with that, Alex, I think I hand back to you. Thank you. No, thank you, Doreen and uh, Fabrizio and all of our uh, speakers and everyone joining. I know there's so much rich uh, expertise, so let's keep the chat. Well, we're gonna close it obviously when the call ends, but we'll record that and please send to Zhang He anything else. I think she sent her email in the note, but you all have her email, I think, for this call. So I think just on behalf of also Chris, uh, my partner here in crime, uh, thank you very much everyone. Looking forward to your continued participation. Uh, goodbye everyone, good night, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And we finished exactly on time. <laughs> and stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you all. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.